Good afternoon, pioneers. How are we doing? Thank you so oh, much for your work. God. Thank you. Man, I'm feeling extra fabulous now. It's great to see you all. Lovely. Well, to kick us off here, I have a question for you all. You're dealing now with two Southerners almost back to back, so I'm hoping to rile you up before you go and have your wonderful lunches as well. But a quick question in the audience here. How many of you within the last five years, even within the scope of the pandemic, have been abroad? All right, wonderful number of hands. The more pressing question, interesting one, how many of you have been to North Dakota? <laughs> A few, <laughs> excellent, congratulations. Well, since you're my perfect audience then, I need to educate you a little bit. North Dakota is the least visited state in the country. It is fenced in by violence. In the West, we have the frackers in chiefs. In the South, we strip mine for lignite coal. In the East, we have the sugar beet mafia. And in the North, we have the prairie plunged with Minutemen missile silos, that is nuclear warheads. Now, to put it to you directly, since North Dakota is the testing ground of the country's worst ideas, let me just shoot it to you straight. The logical outcome of industrial capitalism is human irrelevance. And we're seeing that play out in North Dakota currently. I grew up in a county without a stoplight, in the only incorporated town of 600 people, a hubris name, it's Center North Dakota. It is the center of nothing other than my imagination, I guess. I went to school with the same six girls and 16 boys until I was a sophomore, so even if you were unfortunately straight, the dating options were limited in center. <laughs> but center should also be on your radar now. It is the world's test site for a new technology that I fear environmentalists are behind on combating, combating currently, carbon capture and storage. In your infinite free time, I would urge you to Google and look up Project Tundra. It is being tested out at my family's home power plant where my mother spent the entirety of her career, Minn Kota Power, which is fed coal by Bokal Noonan Incorporated Coal Company where my grandpa Grorby worked the entirety of his career. I did not know this as a child, but I basically grew up in a company town. Everyone I knew and know was connected to coal mining that is the clear cutting of the prairie that I grew up in. Now, one of the perks about being gay is that you know not every story is the only story. I grew up in a landscape of lies and here is the biggest of my life. Every lake in North Dakota freezes that's not true. The lake I grew up swimming in, Nelson Lake, never freezes. Not this year during an El Nino year, but let's go to time past when I'm growing up when it's 20 degrees below zero. You and I could sit in, in Center's home lake, Nelson Lake, with a stocking cap on and it would be bathtub warm. Steam snails into the air. Now, I could go swimming in it, but my parents wouldn't allow me to eat fish from it, though my grandpa Hudson Bueller did, and he died two weeks shy of his 91st birthday, so maybe there were some preservatives in those fish he was eating. But the reason the lake never freezes, as you probably know, is because its water is used to cool the coal-fired turbine engines of the power plant. Now, with Project Tundra, which is currently being debated in North Dakota, 
This technology would capture carbon dioxide emissions on site, convert it to a liquid state, and then pump it 6,000 feet underground to a geologic layer we now call cap rock, where it will stay forever. This is about to unleash a pipeline revolution around the country, impacting every state from Maine to California, from North Dakota to Texas. If you were a part of the 20 teens pipeline wars like I was living in Iowa, I was the first person arrested over the Dakota Access Pipeline in Iowa. Oh. Oh, thank you. I mean, it really felt like a, a twisted homecoming. Be careful if I move to your state. I had left the Bakken oil boom to write my big books about the Bakken oil boom, and that first semester of grad school, it was announced one of the country's largest oil pipeline would be cutting through the county where I now lived. I grew up, though it's hard to believe it, I haven't grown uh, vertically since eighth grade, I only grow other ways now, uh, but I grew up playing basketball against Standing Rock, and, uh, and they always won, let me tell you that. <laughs> so I feel like I knew Standing Rock before the world knew Standing Rock, which is now part of a larger story we're existing in. I felt as the beneficiary of the coal industry, my family works in coal, oil, and natural gas in Wyoming, North Dakota, the Alberta tar sands. I had written op-eds. I had traveled around Iowa to say, this is what Bakken crude oil does to topsoil for growing anything that we need to survive. I tried writing and co-editing an anthology to stop a pipeline because I had learned the question I needed to consider from the elders at Standing Rock, can a prayer stop a pipeline? For me, can a poem stop a pipeline? And I thought I had tried and done everything I could, and four of my nephews in 2016 were drinking water from the Missouri River system, which a Duke University study that year had confirmed was radioactive. For me, I needed to put my body on the line. Now, I'm not here to recommend you all go out and get arrested, though it is a hell of a good time. <laughs> it's one of the most fun times I've had, but I will tell you, in Boone County, Iowa, I was treated very differently than people who were getting arrested in Standing Rock, North Dakota were. The governor had called in state troopers, and when the state trooper asked me to put my hands behind my back, and then he whispered, if you see a video of me getting arrested, there's a smirk, and my aunt asked, Taylor, what, what were you thinking? And I said, even I can bite my tongue. When he said, I can loosen the handcuffs, I wanted to say, no, no, officer, I've always wanted a big, strong man to put my arms behind my back. <laughs> As you all know, you need a little humor to do the type of work that we're all in, my goodness. Uh, and so, at that point, putting my body on the line, my fear, I don't have children. I'm my nephew's favorite gay uncle, of course. And so my worry was that when they are my age, that they would look at me and say, Uncle Taylor, why did you not do everything you could to stop this pipeline? So for me, even as a type one diabetic, which is very risky to be out of control over your body when you are in jail, I thought that's what I needed to do. I needed to test my mettle, which is one story. North Dakota, in addition to its carbon capture and storage, which I should quickly bring you up to speed what that looks like, this pipeline revolution, we cannot use old pipelines to push liquid CO2. We will develop new chrome-lined pipelines up to 48 inches in diameter. Now, the thing you need to know about liquid carbon dioxide, if it meets with water, it becomes carbonic acid. 
Carbonic acid is fatal to you and I, and as you all probably know, all pipelines leak. They break. Liquid carbon dioxide, if it's a windy day, can be converted to a carbonic acid cloud. We've seen this happen in Mississippi. Engines do not operate because of the displacement of oxygen from carbonic acid clouds. EMTs are not coming to you. Even if they do, the EMTs will be dead. If you do not die instantly when you breathe in a carbonic acid cloud, you will asphyxiate eventually and start foaming and you will die. All plant life, all animal life will die. Right now though, it's being packaged as a carbon offset. It is a reward for ethanol, biodiesel, coal mining that now a byproduct, we used to put everything up in Lutheran Sunday School, I was taught as above, so below. We've now got it in a dark, dark way in this country. Instead of just pumping emissions into the endless garbage dump of the atmosphere, we are going to create the nation's largest sewage system that will then push liquid carbon dioxide under states, for instance, like North Dakota. And now why does this concern us? This will traject and cross every state in this country. It will link big agriculture through biodiesel emissions to the fossil fuel industry. Liquid CO2 can replace water in the process of hydraulic fracking. And so this will keep us more dependent on the fossil fuels. We now believe that we can exist by just offsetting our emissions and pumping them underground. We can still stay on coal. North Dakota has the second highest deposit of lignite coal after Australia. We have about 800 years more of coal that we could use. Now, another thing, and why, even though I write fiction and nonfiction is way more interesting, one of the main architects of last year's anti-pornography legislation in North Dakota, which I had talked about on a panel at Bioneers, also worked for 43 years with my mother at Minn Kota Power and is a large proponent of carbon capture and storage. The anti-pornography bill which passed the state legislature, called for a fine of up to $1,200 per library or librarian that was found to be in violation of holding pornographic material under the state's new definition, anything from classic Greek sculpture to biological texts could fall under the purview of this. It had pushed forward legislation that would allow for the imprisonment of librarians up to 28 days. It passed in the state legislature, was about to become law. One person, the governor of North Dakota, vetoed the legislation, but that is how close we were to imprisoning librarians. That idea now has been taken around the country. The most radical version is in West Virginia, where a similar bill under similar obscenity laws would slap librarians with a felony, a $25,000 fine, and up to five years of imprisonment. But to bring this home even more to Bioneers, we have to get to language. It's my favorite thing. The far right is hijacking environmental language. The first case we've seen was last year in Virginia, in Front Royal, in Samuel's Public Library. There was a campaign that said, clean up Samuel's Public Library. Now, if you follow library book banning attempts, you'll know that a majority of the literature that is attempted to be banned is written by or for black, brown, and queer people. And so now we're seeing hijacked environmental language. You and I would love if we saw a campaign that said clean up the Missouri River. We are now talking about cleaning up stories and books. In my state where I currently live, there is a nonprofit in Alabama 
called Clean Up Alabama. The tagline is Tidying Up Alabama's Libraries. This sets forth the debate that there are clean stories and there are dirty stories. It is not a radical step towards removing these persons' humanity to put in my part of the world certain trees back in business. We are now in the fight, not only for the environment, but our own human stories. What I love about the prairie, what most people call flyover country, I don't understand why people love mountains, like they have a big weekend. I climbed a mountain. I'm trying to not curse. Later, we'll all curse together. But I just want to say, cross my prairie. It's about 1,000 miles. Get back to me. You climbed 14,000 feet. I don't care. The prairie is one of the most diverse bioregions we have on the planet. My mixed grass prairie is more diverse than the Amazon rainforest. 100 acres of prairie alone supports 3,000 species of insect, just insect. Nature reveals that for it to thrive, we need diverse ecosystems. Our libraries in our democratic institutions mimic that concept best. So we are now in the fight over the diversity of our libraries, and you all know this. Stories keep people alive. Last year when I was speaking at Brigham Young University, a young queer man came up to me and said, Mr. Rorby, your book got me to take my head out of the noose. I do not take this work lightly because a book transforms a mind, sees that there are different ways through moving the world, and when we are talking about taking stories away from black, brown, and queer youth. We are preventing dynamic thinking and future leadership from thriving in this country. So the work ahead for us all is as local as getting on your local school and public library boards. The sons and mothers, we have a mother and son issue in this country for liberty, are now hijacking these conversations. You now must get on your library boards. You must take back the conversation about environmentalism. And the stories that we need to survive need to be fostered through our public conversations this year and beyond. Thank you.